we at Oak Hill do not just encourage or emphasize doing right things, but we stress, we emphasize doing them for the right reasons. And God only knows how many people appear righteous on the outside while he sees the impurities on the inside. You know, we've had a, a, a great series of lessons on heart diseases and their cure on Wednesday nights. All of those have been recorded to this point. I hope technology continues to work. You can go to that showcase folder file and see every lesson up to this point. And we're looking forward to Lucian's class this coming Wednesday on heart diseases and their cure. And uh, I looked at the calendar and realized that with um, my absence next Sunday morning, uh, postpone anniversary trip, we... Uh, uh, David Newby will be speaking, and then the following Sunday, Dorian Flynn, our missionary supporting there, will be here, and I always love his presentations and his lessons. Uh, looking forward to that. But because of this, I realize that before the summer series starts, this is the last Sunday, the only Sunday available, where I can have a lesson that complements that entire series and that entire study. In a society that only does what it feels like, I'm thankful for Ron's article this morning, for this week. I'm thankful we've been reminded of the truth that Ron has shared within us. It implies several things, but it also implies that pursuing the path of righteousness means that sometimes we do what we may not feel like doing, but we know it's right. We do it because you know, we know it's pleasing to God, it's beneficial to others, and it will help us mature on our growth process. We will be matured by that obedience. Did you know that type of intent behind good behavior renders those outward works and deeds as being acceptable, sincerely acceptable to God? Because he knows that's part of our growth. But what's the goal? What's the goal? Did you know as our body walks, it, you know, it shifts weight? with every step in order to stay balanced, right? Well, I'm, this lesson will be the counterbalance with every other step. Uh, we were going to talk about the same goal, pleasing God by our path along the, uh, the road of righteousness, pursuing Christ. But we're going to achieve this goal in our lesson time by emphasizing this truth without the right intent. No amount of good deed done externally from without will honor God or be spiritually beneficial to you if, if no attention is ever given to cleaning and keeping cleansed the soul within. Doing those external works and the internal cleansing, all that can be simultaneous, of course. But the heart, the heart is a place, as we will soon see, that was also created by God. And therefore, God deserves to be honored by that. God made the heart. He can best see the heart and in which he wants an eternal dwelling. That's our emphasis today. So what does the fully inspired and inerrant word of God have to say about, well, the heart, keeping my heart cleansed? We're building our lives on the foundation of God's complete, inspired, perfect revelation, and I want to know what he has to say about living a clean life. And did you know that every lesson helps us accomplish this goal? What is our mission in Christ? Well, it's to share what we know of Christ to other people in hopes that they get to know those blessings as well. Would you say this with me based on Matthew 28? Equipping disciples to make new disciples. Amen. Thank you for that. On March the 14th, 2021, I preached on these very verses, Matthew 23 and Luke 11. And um, it was, I hope you write the date and go back to that lesson. I preached on how to scrub the inside of that cup. It was an application lesson. I didn't know I'd go back and do a, a part two, but this becomes a part one if I ever do this two-part series now again. Um, this time, and those are great points. We'll conclude later with those because they're so simple. But this time, I want to dig a little deeper into the text and get to the heart of the matter. How can I know for sure that I'm right with God? How can I be sure that all of my efforts to clean my heart are working so that my life is pleasing to him. On Christ's behalf, I am encouraging you to make sure you are not 
an unwashed pot or cup. Matthew 23, Luke 11, we will soon read that text. Here's the simple application. If the inside is dirty, the cup is not clean. Now, I know that sounds profound, but that is so simple and powerful. Have you ever poured a drink into a cup that wasn't clean and you soon learned that it was not clean from what was used before? And whatever the circumstance, whatever was caked on by the washer, if it didn't get rinsed or whatever was previously at the bottom, by the time you poured your preferred drink, it was all mixed and maybe it was too contaminated with what was in there before that you just didn't want to drink it. You poured all of that out. And then you made sure this time to rinse and maybe even scrub before putting it back in the dishwasher. And then you reached for a clean cup and had hopefully more of your preferred drink. Guess what? A cup is not clean if the inside is dirty. No matter how clean it is on the outside. How does this fact apply to people? Well, we will soon read the text, but Jesus used this very principle to apply to people. A person is not clean if he or his or her heart is not clean. Matthew 23, 25 through 26, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cleanse the outside of the dish, but inside they are full of extortion and, and in self-indulgence. How many sins are attached to just using and abusing people, not caring about them, no compassion, and self-indulgence? living for yourself. How many sins are defined or identified by these two categories? Oh, and then he says, blind Pharisee, first cleanse the inside of the cup that the outside of them may be clean also. The Pharisees thought they were righteous and they're being told that they're as contaminated and defiled as, as a dirty cup. Whew. Yeah, he didn't make a lot of friends that day, but he had to speak the truth the way only he could. Luke 11, 39 through 41. Then the Lord said to him, Now you Pharisee, make the outside of the cup dish uh, clean. That's what you're doing. But your inward part is full of greed and wickedness. These are the comparison points. Greed and extortion, self-indulgence and wickedness. Foolish ones, did not he who made the outside make the inside also? But rather give alms of such things as you have. Give what you've got to the Lord. Then... Indeed, all things are clean to you. It's easy then to see one of his clear main points. There are a lot of subtleties, but one main point is a person is not clean if his heart, his or her heart, is not clean. But yes, there's more, so let's learn. I want you to improve your scrubbing, and so we are going to look at the historical textual setting. Just a few principles that we can observe from this text. Let's look on notes about the Pharisees and unwashed pots. Jesus said what he did because they were ritualistic washers. Why were they so ritualistic in their washing? And what were they thinking? We did a Sunday night series two or three years ago on the Pharisees. Have fun looking up that. It was, it was interesting to get inside their mind. They, they revered the law, or so they thought. They took defilement and cleanliness seriously, so much so that they kept missing the main point. They wanted to be so righteous by keeping the law that they forgot what it was all about and started perverting the law. I'm thankful that the Gospel of Mark uh, writes to the uh, Roman Italian Christian uh, audience where Gentiles are converted. You may not know a lot about the Jewish heritage and what they do and why they do what they do. So Mark explains a little bit of this as he's talking about the Pharisees. Mark 7, 3 through 4 explains that the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands in a specific or special way, holding to the tradition of their elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. Why? And, of course, there are many other things which they have and receive and hold, like the washing of cups, pitchers, copper vessels, and couches, they're cleaning everything. They made a reputation for taking simple commands that were given for good reason and then just totally taking them to an extreme and forgetting the reason, thinking that they were either righteous and therefore did these rituals to maintain that or that doing these rituals made them righteous. They missed the boat. The practice of washing all of these externals 
is how they eventually applied Leviticus chapters 11 through 15. Uh, in the wilderness time, there were special rules given to the Hebrew people to keep them healthy and to keep them unique as a people and, and with, with, with instructions that were referencing science that was ahead of their day. So that's an interesting study. However, please read sometime chapter 11, verses 29 through 38. Have fun reading verses 29 through 38. And I want you to notice in this case, not necessarily what is unclean, but I want you to notice for the benefit of our lesson today, how something unclean can contaminate something else or can make a body sick or can make a soul uh, contaminated by corruption. <laughs> so enjoy studying this. How can a vessel become unclean and how can I become unclean if I make contact with that? Something defiled, something dead. Returning to the marketplace, coming back from the marketplace, they didn't know where those pots and pans and dishes that they bought or used uh, came from. They didn't know what crawled over them. They didn't know who touched them and where their hands have been. Folks, they washed everything. In 2020, did you do that? I guarantee you it was not for the same reason they did. They washed everything, to not to avoid the bad bacteria. They didn't, far from that. But they, they, they should have caught on, but they didn't. They... Uh, they were not thinking sanitation. They were thinking sanctification. They wanted to be pleasing in God's eyes by observing all of these rules. And how they looked at pots and how they looked at people, were, they probably valued the pots more than the people, the Gentiles. They were worried about being defiled and unclean in God's eyes. And that sounds like a good intention, right? It sounds like a good, worthy concern. Touching and eating and drinking from a defiled dish would make you un uh, unclean and defiled outside a context for a time to make sure you stay healthy. No, no, no concern about that. Their focus was wrong. In their self-righteousness, the irony is they ceremonially cleansed the inside and outside of all the externals. They completely washed only the externals. They would never treat their dishes the way that they were treating themselves. They appeared righteous to everyone, but to God who knows the heart, Luke 16, 15, they appeared despicable. Think about how many sins are under and came from these categories listed in the text. He saw their greed. He saw their indulgence, people living for themselves, so prideful. Their wickedness, they're caring nothing about good nor other people. Their hypocrisies. You know, if you're not consistent on truth, you're going to be blatantly, uh, your, your error will be blatant. And then lawlessness. Just doing essentially what you want to do, forgetting the heart of the matter as well. The Sermon on the Mount helps us with this. And, and uh, Ron references much of the introduction of the Sermon on the Mount here in the Beatitudes. But as he continues, Jesus preaches Matthew 5, 21 through 26. They would think themselves righteous because they never murdered any other person. They never murdered, so I must be righteous. I, I've never disobeyed that law. But you know what? They were unclean because they were harboring hate in their heart. Referencing David Newby's class last Wednesday night. They were harboring hate in their heart. Will a person murder? Murder, not just kill, murder. If they don't have hate in their heart, that's, that's what the Lord looks at first. That's where it starts. Matthew 5, 27 and 28. They felt righteous because they never committed adultery. So long as I don't do the act, I must be okay in God's eyes, right? But they, they were not content to eradicate the lust and fantasizing about it and channel all those natural desires properly. They missed it. The Pharisees could hide some things from God, but they... No, no, let me reword that. They could hide some things from people, but they could never hide this from God. And so, Luke chapter 20, verses 46 and 47. Luke 20, 46 and 47 implies that no matter how much they tried to keep the outside clean, God always saw the heart. And as a result, then your outside life will never be as clean and, and pure as it could be if you first focus on what's inside. And additionally... The condition of one's heart will eventually be revealed to others. You can keep it hid from some people. You know, you can fool some of the people some of the time. You know that. 
But if the inside's not right, it's eventually going to be seen. Because it's out of our hearts that inspire what we do and say. Jesus really demonstrated this in Matthew 7, verses 20 and 22. Uh, Even though they went through all this effort to clean the externals, their heart was still unclean. And as a result, they were completely unclean. Simple point, but we're enjoying looking at this today. Let's make some contrasts here. Now, let's compare this to us. What about you and I as Christians? Notes on you and I as Christians keeping ourselves cleansed as as, uh, inside-out cleansed dishes, all right? What can we learn from Jesus' rebuke against the Pharisees and keep the inside of our dishes clean, our lives? Well, we need a pure heart, for sure, and that leads to a clean life. So what can we deduce from this passage or from the text of our day? I was looking for a term to explain this. I found one, and I'm going to use it because I like it. Uh, If one's focus is stressing only on cleaning the outward, what are they doing? Uh, We cleaned the house yesterday, and and, uh, it it brought back to mind how this is a good, appropriate uh, analogy. If you think of a better one, let me know. It reveals that white-knuckling doesn't work. Some Christians learn that some externals do indeed need to be cleaned up. Some people say, well, God focuses on the heart, so it doesn't matter what I do. Uh, The right heart does the right things. You better focus on what you're doing because it matters. The right heart does the right things. Some externals do need to be cleaned up because you're representing Christ now. Never again doing certain things. Always now doing these types of things. But don't be like a Pharisee and don't be like a modern-day Pharisee, uh, undisciplined, and fool yourself. So many people will just make the commitments. They will make the commitments. Okay, to be right with God, I'm going to be acceptable by never yelling again, being angry and sinning. I'm I'm not going to do that. I won't express rage or wrath toward my family. Okay, good. I'll also never participate in sexual immorality. Pornography, gone. Okay, to be acceptable with God, I'm never going to lie again, never going to gossip again. All right, I will only speak beneficial and edifying language and it's coming out of my mouth. Yes, only that will be my speech. All of that are great decisions. All of those are great decisions. They absolutely will, by maturity, be made and should be made. All of that will not be easy as well, with the Lord's help you can, but you know, it's easier if you're not working alone or stressing with what we're calling today white-knuckling. What's this? Oh, I'll focus on the outside stuff. Um, some people grip that cleaning brush so tightly that their knuckles turn white. And I encourage you to not take the, app, the counter positive and say, is he saying don't work so hard on the outside? Don't come to me and say that because we have hearing devices now. You can know that that's not what I'm saying. What am I saying? Don't be under the same deception of the Pharisees. If I can just clean the outside, then I'll be acceptable in God's eyes. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe not. Matthew 23, 25 says it doesn't work that way. The lasting new life change comes from within. You can conquer the externals with diligence and guidance because as we work, God works, and so why not give more investment because you invest to uh, let's see the more we invest the more we're blessed so go ahead and commit to those proper behavioral changes don't just tell me what to do but how to do it right we did that before we'll do that again today but just be sure to focus on the heart the whole time that's your intent you want to please god from the inside out and while avoiding the sin of destructive speech think about this while avoiding this i didn't say anything bad today god must be happy while avoiding the sin of destructive speech, pray and study to develop, hmm, what would replace that? Compassion. While avoiding the sin of sexual immorality, pray and study to overcome unrighteous lust. While avoiding the sin of lying and slander, pray and study to overcome hatred and deceit. Get to the heart of the matter. Commit to cleaning the up the outside and the inside focus. Uh, Spirituality is an inside-out proposition. So let's work on what we think. Let's work on what we believe. Yes, you're in Christ now. You're thinking God's thoughts, not yours, God's. And let's work on telling ourselves what we need to in terms of how God sees ourselves. 
lasting change comes from the inside. And this is something that, uh, well, I've, I've spent more time thinking about this point than I thought. I'm, I'm going to add this to this point because um, it, it's important. Uh, even the scriptures say that what I'm about to contrast as something not as important as the first is still important, but what matters more? Character matters more than reputation. I, I ask you to think about that this afternoon. We, we care about our reputation, oh yeah, and what people think about us, sometimes more than what God thinks about us, but, but as important as reputation is, something's more important. That speaks volumes because what people think about you is not always reality. People can lie, and I've heard it said that the reward of liars is people who believe them. People believe lies about you. Okay, that might be your reputation. So character is more important. Character is what is actually there on the inside. Reputation is what people think they see. Now, reputation can come from what's within. I understand that too, obviously. But Matthew 23, 27 through 28 just simply tell us, don't be a whitewashed tomb. Don't care. It's like, okay, people see me. I'm good, so I'm okay. No, you might not be. Let's make sure we're right on the inside. God can see that. People cannot. It's also a joy to know that God knows you. If your heart is right, it's a joy to know that God sees that. That no matter what people see, what people think, or what they misunderstand, God knows all the details. That was either a verbal slip or that was not uh, explained and so it was misunderstood. But God understands why I did this or why I didn't do that. I'm thankful that finite people are not my sovereign judge. I'm so thankful that God is my judge. Prioritize working on what God sees. And then, well, like Second Peter would say, it, it, it'll come out in due time. Okay, letter D. God deserves more than clean behavior. I think it's just a good application point from what we've been saying. God deserves more than cleaned up behavior. A lot of people do that white knuckling. I'm going to clean up my life. But they never focus on the inside. Well, if you're focusing on the outside with the intent to clean the heart, good, that's part of the growth. That, that's where the this article and the lesson complement one another. But Luke 11, verse 40, why does Jesus say what he does? God made both the outside and the inside. Have you ever wondered why, you know, you read a truth and you know it's true, but you ask yourself, why is that there? I can pass the exam. What does God say? Is this true? Yes. Why does he say this? Uh, I'm going to have to think a bit on this. This is one of those passages. Luke 11, verse 40. Why does Jesus say in this context that he made the outside and the inside? Well, it may be obvious in understanding, but putting it to words is a little bit more challenging. The outside, let's focus on the outside, honoring God by the externals. He wants us to understand that the way we live our lives is to honor God and to complement his gospel. We are to live worthy to the gospel. Our conduct must bring honor to it. But he also created the inside, so that means there must be an honoring, a worship to God based on those internal conditions. He deserves to be honored and glorified in the heart. It's conditioned there. Since he created the outside, he has the authority to command how I behave. Since he created the inside, he has the authority to guide and direct my heart. How many people? I've been dunked under the water, but I haven't realized that yet. Ah, scary to think. Don't just clean up your house. Clean up your heart. Let God and his word and his truth, he's the only one who can do this as we yield to that great physician in this case. He cleanses the heart by giving a heart transplant in a way, and then he keeps it clean. He deserves a sacrificed heart. Matthew chapter 15, verse 18, here's the next point. Some people think that religion is all about uh, the external rules. But those rules are actually, and this is amazing to say, not the heart of true religion. All of those rules express the heart, come from a heart that is expressive and rooted in the nature of God's holiness. That, oh, they all make sense. God's, of course, commands do, and then sometimes traditions come from good places. That's good, too, and good intention, so traditions aren't bad. Um, and yet... Sometimes, I've, I've been visiting congregate, I've visited congregations where it's more than obvious they're emphasizing the rules like a Pharisee did. Here's what you have to do, here's how you have to do it, and then you're righteous before God. And then they walk out the door and they mistreat their brother. Uh, uh. You know, the heart of religion is relationship. 
please don't quote me on that outside this lesson because that, that's a cheesy phrase whenever other people say it. It's weak. It's a, it's a cotton candy statement. The heart of the relationship. But they don't study the word to know who Jesus is to let a develop, uh, relationship develop with Christ and who he is. So we have to admit that the heart is relationship and then it produces all of this good. I've got some quotable quotes for you. Scripture never suggests that God is looking for people who can merely discipline their bodies to perfectly keep a set of do's and don'ts by their own credit in order to go to heaven. I don't see that in Scripture. I do see sanctified living comes from sacrificed heart. I do see that. Fueled by a love to better learn the Savior. That's what he's looking for. That's the type of heart that knows, knows what? That doing right things does not make us righteous. Now, don't lose your, your, your lid here. Doing right things does not make us righteous, but seeks to please the Lord from the inside out. A right heart does right things according to Scripture, yes. And final insight. When Jesus describes the Pharisees as tombs, it's an additional subtle point, but this one is like one of those that you get hit or you get shot in, 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 the, in the arm or something, and... and you don't feel the needle at first, but you do and then, you do later, or maybe as the medicine kicks in, you're thinking, oh boy, I didn't know that's what he was saying. Defiled people, defiled people. Forget pots and pans and, oh, did my coat brush across this, this pulpit and was it touched by someone else? Did a gecko rock over it and then it's, now I'm unclean and not right in the Lord's eyes? Oh, come on. Jesus went to the heart of the matter and said, defiled people. He taught that defiled people, defiled people. What does this mean? Okay, let's have some fun with this one. This is the type of point the uh, Pharisees would say amen to and then not understand that he was talking about them. Them. These people who did all this ritual washing so that they would not be defiled by anything or anyone else. According to Numbers chapter 19, way back in the Numbers interesting time in the Hebrews history. The idea of these verses is that if you touch a dead person or even enter into their tent, not knowing the causes of their death, of course, for sure, these rules made sense to keep them healthy. You became unclean for a time and you had to go through certain washings. But notice verse 18, if you're wanting to turn and look there briefly. Just, I'm not going to read it, just let your eyes look at verse 18 of Numbers 19. Anyone who touches the grave is also unclean. What did he say about the Pharisees were? Whitewashed tombs? Dead men walking? Walking graves. Wow. They're contaminated by corruption, self-righteousness, pride. They were so desperate to not be defiled by someone else. But Matthew 23, 15 says... They were the ones defiling others by influencing them with the way that they were thinking about God. Matthew 23, 15. Um, I think about congregations that I have visited in the past and people I've come across in the past. I have a question for you. Oak Hill seems to be really good on this one, but let's make sure we stay this way. Um, would the same be true for us if we were to stress the do's and the don'ts without the who and the why. I think so. In conclusion, let's not focus on just the outside without that focused intent. Glad that we have had this lesson over a year ago so that we can see how to put this into practice. And really briefly, ask God. Ask God. He's the one who can do it. Pray without ceasing. Become single-minded what your focus is to please him. Set your mind on God's things. Study his word. Think his thoughts. Look at the world through his eyes. Scripture's view. Be in God's word. Guard what goes into your heart. Give as alms what is within. He made the inside. Give that. This is incredible. So with all this, we know, we know, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21. He explains how baptism doesn't just clean the flesh. It's not about taking a bath. It's not, it's not about the external, is it? It's about the internal, isn't it? That's why we do it. It is about the internal. Answer of a good conscience toward God because he says so, and there's so much significance and action takes place there. Scriptural baptism 
is or means immersion. And the baptized life is an immersed heart in Christ. I, I referenced it earlier. I want to say that some bodies, some physical bodies have been dunked under water, but they are not diving into the word. Some bodies have been dunked under the water, but they're not living by his will. This has to change from the inside out. Baptism is not about removing the dirt. It's not about the externals. If you think that it is, uh, and you just want to add some religious uh, rituals afterwards, baptism is not for you, not scriptural baptism. It's not about removing the dirt. It's not about someone who wants to continue in their worldly mindsets. Baptism is for people who have a humble heart, yielding to the Savior, to want their sins forgiven, their conscience cleansed, their lives renewed, and the strength to pursue righteousness with every step of the way. For those who devote, for those who want to give back to God what he has made uniquely within you, it's yourself. In accordance with his word, absolutely. That's what scriptural baptism is for. Now I have a question. Are you ready for that? Are you ready for what scriptural baptism is for? If so, you can make this right and put him on in baptism, nothing but the blood as we stand here.